And we're back for another episode of Creators Collective. This is a uh, a fun one this week, um, as we're it's just the three of us. Wait, it was just the three of us last week, wasn't it? I think so. I yeah, it was the year end there. review. Yes, so that's right. I, I guess it's no more fun than normal, but <laughs> we'll make it. We'll we'll find a way. We're here to uh, talk about uh, creating, making, and all the fun things that go along with it. So if any of you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask us. If you are live, go ahead and throw them in the chat, and we will get to them as soon as we can. And uh, if you're not live, uh, feel free to send us an email or a message to any of the three of us or to the uh, the channel here on the uh, Creators Collective YouTube. So uh, that's about it for intro. Uh, Zach, what you got going on this week? Oh, boy. Um, let me see here. What did I write? <laughs> <laughs> like anytime i'm put on the spot i instantly like forget what's going on i have issues Why did I just? oh there it is okay i'm used to being green in the chat i'm red now apparently threw me off so uh um i probably mentioned this last week i think but with um valentine's day coming up around the corner i did those uh the roses the video for the roses and the the silhouette vase out of steel um and i've been selling so many roses like the other i think i made in the past three days i've made like forged 15 of them and mailed them out and they're still coming in so uh <laughs> i've been doing a lot of roses and, i saw that uh, instagram post and it's like holy cow there's a pile of steel roses yeah those are all gone already <laughs> I, I, that's awesome i had like i think i i had an orders for like eight of them and i'm like i'm just gonna make i'll make 15 of them and then literally like by as soon as i finished those 15 roses like i went and checked my email and i'd sold every single one of them like exactly <laughs> 15 of them so at some point i'll have to probably i probably have another week or two worth of productivity on those things if if the orders keep coming in then i'm gonna have to shut it off just because I have a lot of other stuff scheduled that I need to get to. And then um, there's this uh, there's this like online company. Like, I, I don't know. is it, What do you call an online magazine? Is that a thing? Is there a name for that? Blog? Maybe. It's, it's, <laughs> it's like a retailer. It's like a, um, uh, it's called Urban EDC. It's like everyday carry stuff, but it's like a really nice website. And they, they feature a lot of cool handmade stuff. Um, but they are featuring those forged uh, lanyards that I make. Uh -huh. And they just did a pre-order on them to kind of get a feel for how many of them they're going to want. And he just put in a pre-order of 40 of them for me. So I have to knock those out. So I spent all nice. day yesterday forging those. So between the roses and the lanyards, it's like... <laughs> it's taking I'm still waiting for someone to order a dozen roses. That'd be cool. Well, I put that sculpture of the vase and roses on my side. I'm wondering if that's going to go. Um, we'll see. I don't know. It looks really good on our on our, our kitchen table, so I don't really care if anybody buys it. Um, but What do you uh, use yeah. for e-commerce? Uh, like Squarespace. Oh, okay. It's all, yeah, it's no, so here. nice. So easy. Um, but uh, so, yeah, the, the Forge stuff. And then... I just got, um, I've been talking about the sculpture, but I finally, for this law firm that commissioned me to do a big sculpture, it's six feet by a little over three feet wide. Um, so I did the 3D modeling for that after I did the design for it. And I got to go pick up the check to get started on that today. So early next week, I'll, I'll get started on that sculpture, which is, um, that'll be fun. It's, it's crazy. Like I've always, I, I have pretty i'm pretty confident in my fabrication skills like i'm never really worried about building stuff out of metal but sculpture is a whole new dimension and i'd always looked at it and i'm like oh i could do that i could do that but when you get into when you actually start thinking about how you'd make it it totally changes it's not just a matter of you know welding and grinding and cutting it's there you need to have a very evolved strategy to build stuff, especially if you have like you know, curved metal and stuff, you can't just, you don't just cut that out and stick it together. I mean, the amount of math that's involved in, you know, rotating and tapering three dimensional metal, it's not, you don't just go for it. You have to, you have to actually do a lot of work. So I have an entire 
an entirely new appreciation for um, metal sculpture. And fortunately, I think I can't remember how long ago it was, but uh, I don't know if you guys ever listened to the episode that we had Kevin Carone yeah. on. Mm-hmm. Uh, that guy has been so helpful because I jumped into this project thinking like, oh, no big deal. Like, I'll just draw this stuff out and figure it out. And I have probably shot about 20 questions back and forth with him. <laughs> like, hey, man, how do I do this? <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's he's been invaluable. So if you guys if you guys have any interest in metal sculptures and stuff, definitely check out Kevin Carone. Yeah, he has an awesome, awesome channel. Yeah, he has... He has a lot of really good videos. He's anyway. I'll I'll leave it at that. So I'll check him out. What about you guys? What's what have you been up to, Will? Oh man, I feel like I am just always busy. Uh, I'm always running late. Um, I am still working on the Live Edge Vanity. I'm just waiting on some design choices from the clients. Um, uh, just. I'm stabilizing the cherry slabs with more bow ties, uh, waiting on epoxy. Um, I am deep, deep underway in the grizzly challenge between me, Chris, uh, Chris Salamone and Kyle Toth. Holy Um, cow. That wood is incredible. And if you guys haven't seen it on Instagram, you've got to follow (laughs) Will. Uh, That's just, wow. It's yeah. It's a spalted curly Western maple. (laughs) <laughs> um yeah i got it and just kind of looked at it and went whoa uh and once i broke it down so i'm making the i'm making a pair of uh bedside tables and i'm making the legs out of this crazy crazy wow. figured uh maple that is just uh, it's like curly and quilted and spalted and it's just insane um so yeah, working on that. Uh, still trying to figure out the joinery on the apron with like a hidden drawer in it and a bees wing figured babinga top. Um, and then yesterday, uh, it was really exciting. My Sawyer had this really special, crazy, burly. Um, and I do, we do some barter back and forth where I do some film work for them. Um, for social media and they pretty much just give me wood now, which is pretty cool. Um, but we milled up this giant maple log that was entirely full of burl. Um, and my Sawyer had a friend of his with a Lucas mill come out. And, uh, so I got to, I got to go see that. That was pretty fun. Uh, and I came away with, uh, like four cherry burls that I'm going to turn some bowls out of. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I know that was just kind of a rambly ongoing words coming out of my mouth. (laughs) I I have a question. I'm looking at that picture that the end table, that's awesome. Um, what, so when you guys cut the tapers in your legs, Mm -hmm. um, do you guys go, is there a certain degree that you do, or do you just kind of write, like sketch out like where you want it to start and where you want it to stop and just cut that? Or is there like a, looks good. Uh, these were two inch square down to one inch square. Um, and the taper, so there's two straight edges and two tapered yeah. edges. Yeah. I think that the normal go to is one half the thickness at the bottom. Okay. And do you usually, usually start those tapers like right a little, like a couple inches below the aprons mm-hmm. below the bottom? I did a, I did a half inch below the yeah, apron. Same for me. Okay. Huh. You, cool. you can do them. And I really like the look of a tapered apron. Um, though that adds another layer of complexity, which tapered is a, yeah. like where yeah, you, you ta- keep the, the taper goes all the way to the top of the leg, and then the apron matches its angle. Oh wow, that would be cool. Yeah, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> you could get really wacky and do like octagonal. Oh yeah, stuff and yeah, yeah. huh? Yeah, for this one because the wood become octagonal and the top is still square for the joinery. Then in the uh, four of the sides, then peter out into nothing at the corners. It's kind of a a cool look. I've always liked the um, like the the Japanese style, like the design where like you have like the elevated tops and and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's really Mm -hmm. cool aesthetic. 
I haven't done enough woodwork lately to try and work that into anything, but it's, it's something that's always been on my list. I, I just really like that aesthetic of like kind of the suspended tops and stuff. It's very Krenoff. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm still debating on whether I'm going to taper the, do a, do a slight taper on the underside of the table tops or just keep it square. Um, it's very shaker esque. So, and the wood is so crazy that I kind of want to keep the design basic and simple. Mm -hmm. um, Plus, the ingrain know. shows off that spalting too. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. What are you working on, James? Um, well, uh, number one, I'm getting ready to travel to Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, oh, so, cool. next week, actually. Um, next week, after recording the podcast, immediately after recording the podcast, I'm getting in my car and driving 14 hours out to the East Coast. Dude, you are a monster. You just love driving. I do. I actually <laughs> rather enjoy the long drives, especially when I can do it overnight. Those are. It seems like fun. you get excited to do like 14 hour <laughs> drives at night. I do. It's did, like, especially did you just do a 10 hour 10 hour round trip to Matt Cremona's to pick up some slabs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. I, I i feel like you have like some sort of masochism <laughs> rooted deep down inside like i saw that video <laughs> that you posted of like you running through a four degree uh hurricane the other day <laughs> yes <laughs> it looked like one of those like fake snl news reports where people are getting blown away in the background and you're just running <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think it might be you might be onto something there like but, animals uh... flying past you in the background <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah tell, tell us more about your trip the, about uh -huh. your, what, you, what you got planned yeah um, so a week from Saturday uh, the 3rd of February I will be in Fredericksburg at the, uh, the Fredericksburg Area Woodworkers Guild uh, which is one of the coolest guilds that I've come across in the United States um, really well organized and uh, they're, they're really trying to make Fred Fredericksburg Area kind of a, a woodworking destination um, so it's it's a little bit of everything, uh, but I'll be uh, talking at the guild there, and I'm actually going to be bringing uh, my lathe along, my uh, spring pole lathe. So if anyone wants to uh, play on that, that should be a fun time. Um, but I'm also going to be uh, stopping by a few other people on the way, and uh, possibly doing a, um, a collab video with the one and only William Walker. So, woot woot! Uh, should be kind of fun. <laughs> what are you uh, What are you making? Or is that a um, secret? I don't think we've decided on it yet. Yeah, I haven't nailed it down yet. Um, we've, but we've I'm just talked excited about to... doing like a, a hand puzzle, but uh, I don't know. We'll see. Huh. So, oh, other news, not to interrupt, but I'm going to because that's, <laughs> that's what I do. Um, I got uh, my my fear belt grinder up and running, so I'm that much uh, closer to making sharp things. So cool. Brilliant for. Uh, uh, timber slick it's getting closer all right all right so, still a ways uh, out but yeah, but yeah. uh it's getting closer i I'm have all the things i need now other I'm, than the skill I'm, to do it i'm really thinking about uh fabricating a belt grinder because i've got a two horsepower mm -hmm. motor just sitting around yeah that that i could that would power it and be pretty it's, awesome it's one of those things that like after having it and looking at it i feel like yeah i could have made this it's not, you know, but like without having the experience of using one or seeing one in person and stuff, it's. Well, it's also it a very cross useful to... tool, not just for metalworking, but the, the woodworking. It, it has a lot of uh, possibilities because you can get around the belt. and. Yeah, you know, well, the, the, the one that I have it. has the variable frequency drive, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is awesome. I just have a knob and I can adjust the speed nice. to anything. And uh I mean, I, I my my experience with one of those before this is completely limited, but I've I've had it running for like two days in my shop, and I've already used it for so many things that has nothing to do with sharpening objects. So is that a so is that a three phase motor with a variable frequency drive to make it two twenty? It's actually so the the very I think it's a I can't remember the model number, but the the frequency drive you can like hook it up to pretty much anything. Like you can switch the jumpers to have it set up for 120 or, you know, two oh, wow. uh, yeah, it's everything that I'm using. It's plugs into the 110. I could oh, wow. rewire it, but I don't have any need. So how many horsepower is the motor? It's either one and a half or two. 
which I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have enough experience to, to know if I'll need more power, but I really doubt it. I mean, <laughs> well, if you I'm start not, tripping breakers, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to be like, I mean, you have what two inches of belt, like you'd have to push really hard in order to slow that thing down to the point of bogging it down. I don't know. I don't think I'm ever going to have issues. It feels pretty, pretty great. So cool. But uh, it let was, me, it, let me I just this conversation. Yeah, go ahead. It, it's, it's, we're still talking about what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually, uh, you just mentioned, I went up to Matt Cremona's this last week. Um, and uh, uh, got a couple slabs from him, and I got some red oak. Whoa! I know, I know it's scary, <laughs> but uh, they are massive, massive slabs with uh, huge um, openings and bug holes, and uh, beautiful figure in them. So I'm going to be making a dining room table out of these two slabs. They're uh, they originally were 13 feet long. The table's going to end up being about 11 and a half foot long, um, but at the widest point, four foot wide. Um, and nice. it, it's, it's a massively, massively heavy table. The top alone will be somewhere around 400 to 500 pounds. Wow. So the table in total will be well over a quarter ton. Wow. And, uh, um, so did I see you already joined the edges to, to book match them? Uh, well, I, 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 I cut them. I didn't join them, um, because okay. I, right. I, I got the slabs. They're 13 foot long and there were defects on either end that I didn't want in the table. Um, and I can get a 13 foot long board into my basement, but being at that point around 200 to 250 pounds a piece, that would have been quite the ballet uh, mm -hmm. to get them into my basement to work on. So I ended up cutting them in the, in the garage to the close to their final shape lengthwise, and then doing a long rip on them to, to, uh, to get the figure and the, the, the book matching um, right on them. So that I knocked off probably about, uh, 30, 40 pounds from each one to bring them downstairs. But nice. now they're now they're resting in my shop and I'm going to be having them sitting there for three months or so until they acclimate to the shop and fully dry out because they've spent the last uh, two and a half years outside of Matt Cremona's house to acclimate to an air-conditioned basement. And how nice. long did you say that takes? Um, I'm guessing it'll be about three, three months, um, but I don't know. We'll see. Uh, they they are a little bit on the wet side, but I can't tell if that's just wet due to them being outside and a lot of sur surface moisture. Uh, I probably won't know for another week or so until the the surface uh, dries out. You probably don't use any sort of uh, moisture meter at all, do you? Oh yeah, yes I do. Oh you do. What Actually, what? So maybe you can educate me because I in the past like year I think I've come really close to buying a moisture meter like mm -hmm. ten different times. And then I start looking into it and there's so much contradictory information <laughs> that I just say, screw it. I'm not going to buy one. Cause like you have like the pin list and then you have people that say that that's the way to go. And then you have the, the, the pinned ones that I don't know. It seems like nobody, there's not like definitive research out there that says this is the way to go. Well, the, the problem that most it. people have is that most people want to know what is the percentage of the wood. Um, but the problem is it will vary over the length of the board. And number two, it really doesn't matter what yeah. the percentage is, is the long as it reached an equilibrium. So as long as you have something to compare them to, it doesn't matter what how you're measuring as long as you're measuring it the same way. Yeah. Yeah. And you can like, also weigh you, weigh boards too and just yeah, work. That's the, ridiculous. The Who has time for that? Who's gonna well, especially with like this uh, what, eleven foot long an slab? Hour and hour and <laughs> Like that's re that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. That sounds like a <laughs> that sounds like some like old Greek way of doing something where like well, you actually, throw a crown in a bucket of water and figure out how much gold's in it. Like nobody's gonna do that. That's ridiculous. That's actually what I do for some of my smaller pieces. Um, Nobody but yep. James is going to do that. It's <laughs> no, it's it's a good way to to figure out. You know, once it stops yeah. losing weight, it's it's dryish. Yeah. Well, what I, what I, uh, what I'm doing for this one is I have the cutoffs that I, well, that I cut off the end. <laughs> um, and so I have those sitting beside the board. Those will dry out much, much faster than the entire thing because there's more surface area per capita of, of lumber. Um, right. so I'm going to be keeping an eye on those. And when those stabilize out, which I'm guessing they're going to stabilize out around 8%, um, from my basement, um, then I know that that is the equilibrium of the wood. And so then I can just wait until the slabs reach whatever that percentage is. And I'll know that they're dry for that room. Do you because think it'll get down to 8% in your basement? In my basement dry? right now, because my basement's like 25% humidity. 
Okay. So it's it's really dry in here. My my uh, most of my white oak stock is actually a lower percentage than um, my meter can read. Wow. So it, it gets really dry down here. Hmm. Uh, but that's that's really nice for woodworking though, because when you know that wood is as dry and as small as it will get, um, it becomes very easy to calculate wood movement because you know that it's only going to get bigger. That's true. Um, mm -hmm. So you just you can you can leave the space. So if you want a really nice tight joint, then you just make it a really mm -hmm. nice tight joint, and that way when it goes anywhere else, it's just going to become tighter. I got to figure out if I get the time this year. I got to do some more work on my uh, my workbench because the humidity fluctuations here are outrageous. I mean, yeah, yeah, especially I mean, in the garage. They say in the book, like you're, you know, in like the all the the science books and stuff, they're like, well. You know, theoretically, a board can move this much or this much, but realistically, this is here. It moves. It it moves to both extremes. I mean, we go from super dry to a hundred percent humidity, like back and forth all year round. So, like the top on my workbench is actually uh, cupped fairly bad on the back. Uh, so it's it's glued on the front of the the apron, and then where it comes in the back, everything else is just it's not glued down so that it could move, but it actually curled up. So I have about maybe a half inch gap on the backside of the, uh, the workbench to the under between the workbench and the top on the back. So the, fortunately the front part's straight, I have enough straight parts in my sh uh, <laughs> things in my shop to where it's not an issue and the bench is still functional, but it just irks me that the wood moved that much on there. And, and especially with given that I, allowed it the movement it just decided to move in the direction that i didn't want it to move so i'm thinking about doing like a plank top on it which i think kind of makes sense for uh places that fluctuate humidity just yeah do do some like uh some two by sixes and just hammer them down and, and countersink some like one na two nails per board just to give it some room granted there'd be maybe a you know, a eight sixteenth of an inch gap between boards, but I think that would help minimize the, you know, the warpage. A lot of the fear that people have about wood movement um, comes from days before air conditioning, because mm -hmm. if you're in a house without air conditioning, the moisture, the humidity movement, just about anywhere in the United States, is is incredibly wild. Well, in most anywhere in the world. Um, and so when you have that that amount of moisture movement, your your wood movement can be drastic, um, yeah. a, a quarter inch over the, the width of a, of a small tabletop, um, which is is, is horrible. Um, but when you're when you're making something nowadays for um, for an air conditioned space, it's not as much of an issue. Uh, the yeah. wood movement is far less. And so I think a lot of people still have that that old fear. But then it's still always good to have things built to withstand that. So when they get moved and you know get stored in a garage for a year or two, they don't uh, self destruct. Yeah, I think shop furniture you have to be. Or yeah, especially if you're in a garage. But yeah, stuff that's, that's the nice thing I have in the basement here is it's always air conditioned, it's always heated, it's always the same. Yeah, ground, which is really yeah, nice. And Florida's got to be one of the worst places for wood movement. I mean, it's <laughs> yes, it's rough here. Uh, I always like looking at our. <laughs> I always like looking at. We've got some antique, uh, like um, like secretary's desks and things in our house. Um, and the the drop down desk portion of the secretary's top is a uh, panel with breadboard ends. And seeing how much the wood has moved um, yeah. with those breadboard ends, I mean, it's you know it's charming now, and, and you know you can see that it's an antique, but as the woodworker, I'm look, I always like look at it and study, you know, how they did things, you know, back then and, um, and really seeing how a breadboard pretty cool. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing, um, Matt Cremona doing a, a, a video on that for his outdoor table. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause he put breadboard ends on that. And the thing is what, 44 inches wide. So there's gotta be mm -hmm. a, a cool amount of movement against that breadboard. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking, to, looking forward to seeing if he ever shows, variation from one one time to the other because it's, it's outdoors so it's it's got to be a, a massive amount of absorption yeah um oh real quick james that fredericksburg area woodworkers guild i'm also mm -hmm. speaking uh there in april cool so um i want to pick your brain after you speak there and and see how it, it how it goes and i don't i don't know why they want me but they they emailed me and asked me so <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, I should I should mention that before I forget. Um, I know there's a few listeners in the Tampa-ish area, but there's the Tampa Woodworking Show this coming weekend, which is the twenty. What's today? Twenty fifth. So, well, actually, tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, there's a handful of us meeting for breakfast tomorrow at, uh, um, a breakfast joint <laughs> by the woodworking show. So, uh, if anybody's interested, shoot me an email or, or something. I, I created a local Facebook group. So if you're in the area, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll add you to the group. Maybe we can meet up tomorrow because we're, we're all going to be there. So cool. Well, we have a few questions. Yeah. Um, uh, for, for she, Sean for she, Fushi, Fushi. You can tell I'm not good. At names. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people out there who say, you know, I'm good with faces. I'm bad with names. I'm just, I'm just bad with names. Is it, yeah, Fushi. I feel like that's something to do with French cooking. Is that where that name came from? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, he asked in the live chat, I'm curious as to your thoughts about O1, A2, PMV11 and uh, for a hybrid shop. You guys have anything you want to weigh in? Um, I know. So I just recently put the uh, Hawk iron, it's O1 tool steel in my, uh, in my number four. And I love it now that I got the back flattened. Um, According to Hawk, the O1 tool steel is easier to sharpen. Is that right, James? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and it keeps a, a relatively good edge for a while. Um, I'm not sure about the A2 or PMV11, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, the, I don't actually know the difference. The, the, the big thing is for steel in general, the harder the steel is, the harder it is to sharpen, but the better it holds an edge. Unless it gets too hard, then it becomes brittle and you might chip off an edge. Um, whereas the softer it is, the easier it is to sharpen, but the more often you're going to have to sharpen it. So you're kind of playing back and forth. And most of these tool steels are like right in the middle. I mean, they're all right next to each other. Um, and, and the way I like to tell it is a lot of people, you're really not going to notice the difference until it's something you've been doing for a year or more. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people really get bent out of shape over, you know, what's the best tool steel. And there really is no the best um, because 99% of the people out there are not going to be able to tell a difference in their everyday use. Um, unless you've been, you know, doing it for years, it's, it's not something you're really going to feel. Um, now, that being said, everyone has their own personal preferences. <laughs> if uh, like for me, if I'm ordering from Veritas and they give you the choice of uh, they give you the choice of O2, A1, uh, O1, A2, or PMV11, I actually choose PMV11. Um, I, I find it to it sharpens fairly easily, um, but it is a I find it to be a fairly resistant steel, um, and so I, I like its balance a little bit better. O1 tends to be the easy one to sharpen, but it's probably going to dull a little bit faster. Um, A2 is the one that's a little on the harder side um, and can sometimes be a pain to sharpen. But when I say, you know, it's a pain to sharpen as opposed to an easy to sharpen, that might be the difference of like, you know, a half dozen strokes. Um, so yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it, it's not something that's that's that much of a, a difference. So. And I feel like honing your sharpening technique is is more important than. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, like, so, like I'm dealing with all these crazy figured woods right now. And so I'm constantly going back to my stones to yeah. sharpen. And so I just have my water stone out my, my 6,000 grit water stone out, um, you know, with a tub of water and, you know, as long as it, I keep it flat, you know, every 30 minutes or so, or even if that depends on how much planning I'm doing, um, I can just run over to the stone real quick, do a few laps, hit the strop and then get back to work. Um, and it's not a huge deal. So, no, I think for the the hybrid woodworker, like, like he's asking here, there really isn't that much of a difference. It's uh, you, you're really not going to tell that much of a difference, <laughs> um, unless it's unless it's something that you're you know you're you're regularly using the hand plane as as a main go to tool. Um, you're you're probably not going to notice it. Yeah, as a hybrid woodworker, uh, probably the most hybrid woodworker. In out of the three of us, um, 
I'm claiming that title. Um, <laughs> uh, I would I use O one and yeah, I love it. Uh, and so yeah, it's probably the most common too. O one is. Yeah, Zach, do you have any thoughts on that? Being the the resident metal gay. Um no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. I mean, I metallurgy is a whole. I mean, that's chemistry, like. I'm not quite there yet. I think I think I'll soon have a better under. I mean, I know the fundamentals, but as far as actually, I mean, you guys will know better than I will from using it in your hand planes and stuff. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Eventually, I'll probably know more, but not yet. Yeah, cool. talking right. more to, uh, to to getting a sharpening technique down. Um, like when I do my final smoothing on a project for like for instance, this side table. Uh, some of the pieces were fairly figured. Uh, most of it was just fairly straight grain, though. Um, when I actually did the the final smoothing on it, you know, the last thing to touch the the wood, um, I ended up sharpening my blade like every seventy to a hundred strokes. Okay. Um, so really often, less than every five minutes. But when I when I say I sharpened it, I would take it out of the plane, I would leave the chip breaker on, and I would strop it. Oh, then, okay, nice. Um, and you know, just doing twenty or thirty strokes on the strop, putting it back in kept that blade at, at perfect tone so that as I'm working along, it's, it's running. So See, that I always, was interesting. I always had the, I always used the Norton water stones um, mm -hmm. to sharpen everything. And I finally, mm -hmm. I realized that like I put off sharpening my planes because yes. if like pull out your stones and like there's slurry everywhere, it's dirty, you soak them in a thing for 10 minutes and then you get them out and there's water all over. It's just a mess. <laughs> um, I just got sick of doing that. So I finally actually went on, went on to your uh, website and just ordered all of the sharpening stuff that you use, the three diamond. <laughs> What's like your methodology for that? So there's, what is there? The course, the fine and extra fine. Is that what mm -hmm. I spent my money on? Yeah. <laughs> I don't I, even know. I just ordered, <laughs> I just clicked and bought them. <laughs> when, when a lot of people think about sharpening, they think about, you know, going through all of it. And, and, and that's, that's very much like how Paul Sellers does it. Every time he sharpens, he goes through every single step. Um, and I, I do a variance, you know, how dull is the blade? Um, mm -hmm. Most of the time through my average building, I let my blades get fairly dull. Um, now, fairly dull to me might be, you know, still keenly sharp to some other people. Um, but, you know, I get to, them to the point where I don't want to use them anymore, and then I'll take them back and hit all three stones. Um, if I'm working with a figured wood and I'm still, you know, I'm taking off a, a large chunk, I may sharpen them more often and I'll just hit the, the higher two grits or just the one high grit. Um, and I'll do that, you know, every 150 to 200, maybe 300 strokes. So um, do you, um, when you go back to hit the course, the fine and the extra fine, are you doing, do you do any sort of micro bevel when you sharpen or do you no, just, you no. just go flat at how, yeah, how I, many degrees you, you usually, usually go? I'm sure you have varying, varying degrees I, that you use. You no, know, most of my plane irons are 30 degrees. Yeah. Um, I, I really like 30 degrees because it, it allows them to wear a little bit longer um, and mm -hmm. they're easier to sharpen. Whereas if you go yeah. down to a 25, I, for like my low angles are at 25, that takes a little bit longer to sharpen because there's more surface area. Yeah. So 30 degrees, you, you don't have to reset your, your bevel at all. I was assuming yeah. that. And then, no. uh, so what, how many passes do you, does it usually take for? Like I do course. it until I get scratch marks evenly across the entire surface of the bevel. Yeah. Um, and then I move on to the next stone and get those scratch marks all the way across. It's and usually, you, you know, 30, 40 strokes or so. On each? Yeah, if, if I'm doing a full sharpening from one to the other. And then do you uh, use the, uh, do you like, do you pull back on the flat surface to take off the, the burr? Um, well, like my average sharpening, no, I'm just using, I'll do the bevel on all three and then on the strop, I'll do 30, 40 strokes on the strop and then I'll flip it over and do the back on the strop with a couple strokes and that will, the, the burr falls off there. Oh, okay. Um, that's, yeah. that's for my average sharpening. Um, if, if like I have a nick in the blade and I really need to work at it, um, then I, I have an extra, extra coarse stone that's like, like a 150 grit diamond plate. And I pull that out to really take off a lot of material quickly. The problem with taking that off is I get a really big burr on it. Um, and so I will, I'll do it on that and then I'll go through the other three regular plates. Um, and then I will take it back um, to the, the finest plate and pull the burr off there. 
And that way I can get rid of that really heavy burr and then I'll go and do my regular sharpening process of oh. See, I learned course. like I think I originally learned how to sharpen plain irons from watching the Rob Cosman videos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he does it a little bit differently, but oh, yeah. so but I do, do so many different ways. It's yeah, I do do a micro bevel, a secondary bevel, mm -hmm. um, just just because I can. But I also do everything by feel. So you know, I put the bevel down on the stone, find you know where the bevel sits flat on the stone, then I do my laps, and then just at the very end, you know, on my final grit, I'm using water stones, but same thing with diamond stones. I just lift up, you know, a hair mm -hmm. and then do, uh, you know, I pull back a few passes um, just so I can see that there's, that there actually is a secondary bevel. And then I take it to my strop and, uh, you know, make sure that that burr falls off the, off the backside. Yeah. Well, then the other, the other thing comes uh, when you're, when you're sharpening, um, if you're using a jig, you're keeping a perfect bevel. Uh, when you're doing it freehand, you tend to have an ever so slight camber um, mm -hmm. front to back of the bevel. And I actually like to exaggerate that camber just a bit. Um, and so I don't have a flat edge on the bevel. So my the tip of my blade might be at like 32, 33 degrees, whereas the back of the bevel might be at like um, 28, 29. Um, and so there's it's, it's rounded, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but that's... That is, um, so I mean, it, I do end up having a, a secondary bevel slightly because of that, but that's just because of a slight rocking in the arm. <laughs> yeah, um, but I'm I'm a very pragmatic woodworker. As long as it's taking nice shavings, I don't really well, care. <laughs> do you run the blade? Um, so if the it is the blade in line with your stone or at ninety degrees to your stone when you're sharpening it. I'm about 45 degrees to the stone um, mm -hmm. just because that's what I feel like it where I can kind of hold that bevel nicely yeah. with both hands and I can just kind of, you know, yeah. and that'll give you a much, much flatter, flatter bevel. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I tend to hold um, mine fairly close to in line with the plate. Oh, really? I feel like that's harder to hold that way, but yeah, that's, that's where you get more of that, that rounded bevel. Yeah. And this is a good segue to Jonathan's question. Um, Windex is better than water stone than water for diamond plates uh, because it evaporates faster than water, so plates don't rust. Right? Do you have any alternatives to Windex? Um, I've never tried anything else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have tried um, lapping fluid that's designed for diamond plates, um, but it's like you know ten dollars for this tiny little squeeze bottle. Yeah. Um, so I, I go to the dollar store and buy the cheapest Windex, the cheapest glass cleaner I can yeah. find. Um, I have heard this is other totally hypothetical plexiglass cleaner. Okay. Uh, because oh. it doesn't have um uh what is this pneumonia? Um no yeah. there's, uh, uh, ammonia? there's yeah there's something in there that some people <laughs> think um, what I didn't you, I think you said pneumonia. Yes it has pneumonia <laughs> 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 yeah, there's something oh, the in regular port. glass cleaners that some people don't like uh, with the the nickel plating, um, but I've never had an issue with it. So, yeah, just get the cheap glass cleaner. I use, I actually use water on my stones just because I because it, I it's a constant supply, and then I just wipe off the stone. Diamond plate, no big deal. Uh, and then Jonathan's other question, and I feel like this is. Uh, for me growing up in construction, growing up in the job site, um, maybe not a jigsaw blade, but how would you bend back a bent jigsaw shoe base after dropping it on the ground? I wish I didn't have to ask this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I actually misread that question. I thought he was talking about how do you bend back a blade, uh, but the shoe, the base, I don't know, tap it out with a hammer on a hard surface? A lot of those are made out of magnesium, though, I think, the nice ones, which is probably brittle, but I don't know. Yeah, magnesium yeah. is a little more brittle than a folded steel. Like a lot of the, you, like I know with a lot of the circular saws, the plates are magnesium because it's lighter. Yeah, well, that's what they sell you on anyway, magnesium alloy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what I've done in the past is I'll put it on an edge of a table so that the bent part is overhanging the table and I'm basically using it as a break and then using a rubber mallet to tap it down. 
Um, because if you if you hammer it on a flat surface, then the piece of metal will never bend. It'll rebound. It. Yeah. yeah, it always rebounds. So it'll never actually get back to flat because you actually need to bend the metal past flat so that it rebounds to where it should be. Yeah. Um, but the, the key is just taking time and going very and, light. And also, I think it matters if it's um, cast or not. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If it's cast, it, it's, yeah. Not, it's not going back. It prob- if it's cast, it probably didn't bend in the first place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it probably just It snapped. would be a totally different question. It would be, how do I glue together the base of my cheeks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cool. cool. Well, you guys want to move on to uh, what we're watching, reading? Uh, well, how about the joke of the week? Oh, that's right. I always forget the joke of the week. <laughs> we actually just had one from uh, Jeff Groff, um, and he just posted it in the, the chat. That guy um, is the king of jokes. Oh, like, yes. Every, he's, he's always got something for us. What did the beaver say to the tree? It's been nice knowing you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I, for I like some it. reason, my channel has become known as the Dad Joke Center Central, and I'm I think uh, it's kind of rubbing off on the podcast now. <laughs> I can yeah. see why your why your channel would be the Dad Joke Central. <laughs> I can see that. We'll have to do. You know, what we should have done last year is the worst of woodworking jokes. <laughs> yes. Like the top three least funny woodworking jokes. <laughs> okay. Nice. Uh, Will. All right. Yes. <laughs> uh, I have been watching Planet Earth 2. Uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I watched the original BBC Planet Earth series. Um, and then it just came out on Netflix uh, streaming Planet Earth 2. And if you want to learn anything about filmmaking, watch Planet Earth 2. It's amazing. Um, the, as someone who has studied films from, you know, my teenage years and, and now makes videos on the YouTubes, um, I, I study films and, and like, not like a normal viewer would, but I actually watch like, well, how would they get that shot? How did they get that shot? Look at the the transition in here in the story. Planet Earth 2, what they do with L video of, of animals and making the storyline, making it dramatic is so incredible if you watch it from a filmmaker's point of view. Um, and David Attenborough just it has a very soothing voice. So uh, Planet Earth 2 is what I'm watching. Sweet. Yeah. Well, I have been uh, watching the hand tool school. Um, as uh, some of you know, I'm, uh, I've, I've purchased quite a bit of what he has over there. And uh, Shan Rogers, I love his teaching style. Uh, it's very smooth and easy and, and very well thought through. Um, so, you know, a lot of people have looked at the hand tool school and he has it broken down into semesters where you can learn an entire semester's worth of projects. Um, and he has build videos and other information. And most of the semesters are like, you know, 30 hours worth of video. Um, they're they're an incredible amount of information, but he's recently been doing a lot more of individual how-to videos. So you can actually just go and buy a particular how-to on a topic and goes into great detail on any particular topic. So like sharpening and you know, here's an hour long video on it um, and a great source of information. So um, definitely if you want to dive into hand tool woodworking, um, hand tool school, it's a good place for it. I know. How about you, Zach? Um, so I'm reading a book called Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau? Thoreau? I don't know. I've never Thoreau. heard his name mentioned. Thoreau? Thoreau. Yeah. Thoreau, yeah. So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's just about like this, uh, uh, I think probably mid-1800s, this guy that just moves to Walden Pond, which is in like Connecticut or Massachusetts or somewhere up there, and uh, just kind of does his thing. So interesting yeah. little introspective quasi philosophical book yeah, it's actually um one that uh, uh roy underhill mentions a lot really hmm. huh. yeah he like he goes out and I, I haven't gotten too far into it but apparently he kind of makes his living off of uh making stuff and working with his hands and it's a little 
and its step keep a thesaurus handy for, which is <laughs> not usually my favorite types of reading material. I don't like it when people try and write to sound intelligent, but I think that's just the nature of any book written in the 1800s. There's a lot of references and stuff that I'm like, I have no idea what this means, but uh, there's, there's some good stuff in there too. There's some quote the other day that I'm paraphrasing, but it's something along the lines of it's talking about how people are too concerned with uh, being respected rather than being respectable. I just thought that was kind of cool. So, <laughs> but there's a lot of good, good little nuggets of, thought in there cool well uh since you're talking what uh, what's your tool of the week um i can't remember i might have said this one a couple of weeks ago um it is a 3m full face uh mm -hmm. respirator uh because i'm painting with some really nasty stuff and working on my truck uh primer and paint and all sorts of stuff that you don't want to breathe and having facial hair pretty much makes those little nose and mouth respirators completely useless. So um, the full face one actually seals really well. Uh, so speaking of the truck channel too, I've been putting a lot of thought into that and I'm probably going to move my truck channel videos to my main channel soon because the way YouTube is um, changing all their monetization stuff, uh, small channels just get destroyed. So I'm probably going to move everything over to my main channel soon. So Stay tuned for that. Looking forward to seeing that truck. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's coming along. It's starting to look pretty good. I was hoping to have the video out by the end of the month, but um, the weather just hasn't been cooperating. Uh, it needs to be, you know, a minimum of 60 degrees to, to shoot paint and do that sort of thing. So uh, as, as soon as it warms up, I'll get moving on that. I'd love to have the whole thing in paint by the end of February, but we'll we'll see. Cool. Will, what you got? Oh, uh, it's got to be my new Grizzly 8-inch spiral head, spiral cutter head jointer uh, that I just put in my shop. Uh, it's amazing how much quieter it is than my older uh, straight yeah. knife jointer, um, which is a great jointer, and I love it. And I found it on Craigslist and, you know, tuned it up and got it real purdy uh but the spiral head just kind of purrs you start it on and it just kind of goes Ooh. <laughs> uh, i love the sound of a good quality joint or a planer it just it, they're so quiet but so yeah yeah but yeah so got that in my shop and it's pretty and i've been jointing boards i got it i got the tables level and coplanar to each other within three thou of an inch over six feet so Nice. I think that's that's flattering my joiner plane. Well, there you go. <laughs> you got cool. Yes. I am actually going to pick the minivan. I Whoa. I love my minivan, um, and you know I I, I I have thought quite a bit about getting a truck, but the problem is the truck bed. If I have an eight foot bed, is the same size of a bed as my minivan. Except for in my minivan, I can get a 2 by 12 12 foot long in and close the door. <laughs> um, or I can fit full cabinet grade sheets of plywood in there and close the door. And so I get it, you know, it's no longer, you know, in a cab. Uh, and, you know, no longer outside in the weather. And it's it's so fast and easy to, to fold the seats down and go. It's It's not having another vehicle that, you know, you have an entire truck that you spend a lot of gas money on that you're you're only actually using it to haul things occasionally. Whereas with a minivan, you can use it for, you know, hauling the kids and all that, but uh, still actually have a truck. Now, See, don't get me wrong. Someday I will get a truck because I'm a man. I must have a truck. <laughs> <laughs> I love my, I absolutely love my truck. My wife loves my truck. Um, it's our family hauler. Granted, I don't have three kids. I only got the one. Um, but to have a bed that is, you know, line X, rhino lined, whatever, um, that you can just throw stuff in the back and only have to worry about damaging the thing that you're throwing in the back and not damaging your truck. Uh, and you know, you can put things, I've got a, uh, a cat, a cap, a truck shell on the back of my truck. And so I just flip up the window and anything longer than the bed of my truck, I just let it hang out the back and yeah. strap it down. Yeah, so I had, well, uh, well, 20 foot, 20 foot long lumber in my minivan this summer. 
Did you have to open the back? Yeah. Yeah, actually, I have a uh, I have a, a sheet that I can tie up inside that actually seals the back. So when the, the door is open or strapped down to it, I don't have the exhaust coming in. Nice. Uh, I have a must watch recommendation for anybody out there. Uh, if I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Tim and Eric awesome show, but they did a ridiculously funny video called minivan highway and like <laughs> retro nineties yes. style. Yes. Um, <laughs> there's the link in the live chat, but it's, it's, it's such a good so one. Good. It's so bad. It's perfect. So yeah, watch it. <laughs> Cool. Well, you guys have uh, been with us for another hour, so uh, thank you for that. I guess these boil down to about 45 minutes, so we're, we're saving you 15 minutes of time. <laughs> <laughs> so I do want to say a huge thank you to our patrons on Patreon, and uh, you guys have been a, a huge encouragement to us, and we're looking forward to uh, seeing what we can do for you in the future. Um, if you want to follow any of us, you can find all of us on our YouTube channels or Instagram or wherever the cool people are at. There are links in the description below. And that's about it for this week. So until next time, see ya. Later. Thanks, guys. <laughs>